it's not like we start recording and that's this is the podcast Welcome to the Asian Sewist Collective podcast. The Asian Sewist Collective is a group of Asian people from around the world brought together by our shared appreciation for fiber and textile arts and our desire to see more Asian representation in the sewing community. In this podcast, we explore the intersection of our identities and our shared sewing practice as we create a space for Asian sewists and our allies. I'm your co-host, Ada Chen, and I am recording from Denver, Colorado. Denver is a traditional territory of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples. I'm a marketer turned entrepreneur, and these days you'll find me running my own all-natural skincare business called Chuan Skincare, that's C-H-U-A-N Skincare, and sharing my marketing tips on my blog, The Cultivate Method. Most importantly for this podcast, you can find my sewing at i.hope.sew on Instagram. And I'm your co-host, Nicole. I'm based outside of Chicago, Illinois, the original homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, the Potawatomi, and the Odawa people. I'm a Philippine ex-American woman and a lawyer by day and a sewing enthusiast the rest of the time. You can find me on Instagram at Nicole Angeline Sews. So before we dive into this week's episode, Nicole, can you tell us a little bit about your current sewing project? Yeah, I'm still working on my my first blazer. It's the Style So Me Nikki blazer. Uh, because it is uh, we're wrapping up Asian uh, Pacific American Heritage Month, I am trying to get this turno sleeve done for the blazer. <laughs> I'm trying to not in the spirit of self-care, rush myself <laughs> on it. <laughs> so, I might not get the blazer or the the turno done before the end of May, but it'll be fine. How about you, Ada? What are you working on? I'm sure it's going to look great. I am ending Me Made May strong. I went in with no plan, nice. but I'm ending it strong with a pink twill Zadie jumpsuit from oh. Paper Theory. I have, I thrifted like six yards of this really cool pink twill like months ago, and I still have a lot left. And so listeners, if you have suggestions on what to do with three to four more yards of pink twill, send them my way. But I made a wearable twill of the pattern a few months ago, and then I struggled with adjustments on the pants. So I put it down for a while. And now with the pink version, which was the original one I wanted to make in the first place, I'm at the fit stage. So I'm making some adjustments before I sew up the seams. And I'm learning that it is hard to take volume out of the front of your pants. So today's topic is all about self-care, and we've invited one of our podcast team members, Erica Yao, to join us for the discussion today. Welcome, Erica. Can you please introduce yourself? Thank you. I'm glad to join you today. I'm Chinese-American, but now I live in Toronto, Canada. I first started sewing on a sewing machine when I was about eight on a whim one day when I wanted to know what was in the box in the back of my mother's closet. So she pulled it out and showed me the basics of how to use it. And from then on, I was hooked on sewing my own clothes through high school. Once I left home for college, I stopped sewing and stopped through all of my 20s. And I didn't pick it up again until after my first child was born. Um, At the time, as a new mother, I just decided to put my career on hold after she was born with... um, and was kept getting diagnosed with a number of medical and neurological issues. So... I stopped working and it was at that time that I picked up sewing again because I had all this unstructured time in my life. And then I I dealt with her issues for a while and went on to have two more kids. Then when they got older, uh, I finally decided to pick up my career again. So I felt like I had these large chunks in my life where I had had, I sewed and then I I put that on hold and then I devoted, you know, my, my energy to my education and picking up, uh, starting my career. And then that was, it was forced upon me to put that on hold. So I picked up sewing again um, while I parented. And then, so it's interesting. And then you, you take these long breaks and then you come back to things later. It's interesting to observe how I feel differently about doing something um, when you take a break and then come back to it. And how would you say your sewing practice intersects with your identity? Well, since I've been sewing since I was a kid, um, my sewing practice ebbed and flowed as I figured out my own sense of identity. I've always loved clothes and fashion since I was a kid, but my parents did not encourage those interests because they felt that uh, thinking a lot about what you wore was was a frivolous pursuit and it was a very bourgeois habit to have. So 
you know, they didn't really approve of it. They were both from families with traditions of high academic achievement back in China, going back for generations. So for me, growing up, sewing was an acceptable hobby, but my parents did not want me to pursue it as a profession and did not want me to pursue work that depended on using my hands. So when I was in a teenager, I, I used to pour hours and hours into my sewing and they would definitely comment about how I was spending those those hours of my life, but it it was it was acceptable because it was just a hobby. And when I reflect back, it's it's uh, oddly enough, it's the time I spent sewing my own wardrobe as a teenager. I felt was almost like an act of rebellion against those traditional Confucian values. Although my clothes were far from rebellious looking, because I was obsessed at the time with uh, learning about couture sewing techniques. So, you know, thinking back today, um. I'm not sure I can disentangle some of those feelings of guilt I have when I when I spend my time sewing. Yeah, late nights sewing is definitely something that I am familiar with as well. And we have talked about, you know, sewing habits and self-care. So the three of us and a lot of other members of our podcast team have been talking about self-care for a while. So before we dive into some sewing related discussion, let's define self-care. In Psychology Today, Dr. Shana Ali, a mental health clinician, educator, and advocate, defines self-care as, quote, a holistic process that we all need in order to foster presence, engagement, and self-love. She elaborates that self-care is not a singular skill. Instead, it includes a wide, wide variety of tasks that are tailored to meet your diverse needs. So although there may be similarities between self-care strategies, self-care is subjective and tends to vary from person to person. Now she also says that self-care is a continuous process. It's continuous and it's a proactive consideration and tending of your needs in order to maintain your own wellness. And although it's become more mainstream in the last few years, the term self-care, quote unquote, actually spread from the medical community to the larger community in the 1960s, thanks to civil rights advocates. In particular, the Black Panther Party practiced community care by distributing food, creating health clinics, and building education programs. These were not only acts of survival to help the communities that they were in, they also changed the wider narrative about caring for oneself. Now, at the same time, Self-care was popularized as a way to counteract activist burnout and allow activists to bring their entire selves into the movement. You bring up a good point about survival and community care. Oftentimes we hear about self-care being compared to like an airline safety video. You have to put on your own oxygen mask first before you can help others. And as we wrap up Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month and Mental Health Awareness Month, it feels appropriate to point out that self-care can also have an effect on mental health as well. Self-care relies on some level of self-awareness, which can help those with mental illness or those who are supporting someone with mental illness recognize triggers or patterns in their emotions or thoughts. Yes. Now, as we discussed in episode two, mental health is an important but often not discussed topic in Asian communities. And as we shared before, Asian Americans are three times less likely to seek mental health services than other Americans. Now, certain groups also within the Asian diaspora have a higher than average risk of suicide and mental illness. When we talk about self-care in the context of identities, I'm curious, Erica, how do you define self-care and why is it important for you? To me, self-care is a way to cope with daily stress. So stress is going to be inevitable. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that doses of it can be really healthy and productive, but there has to be a way that you can get breaks from it so it doesn't become, become overwhelming. To me, self-care is about rest whether that means active sleep or active time spent pursuing something that's nourishing to your body, mind, and spirit. I think I align with that as well. My more like narrow personal definition of self-care is really just giving myself the luxury of focusing on one thing, engaging in one thing. And maybe it's because I grew up like I was a child of Sesame Street and my attention span is shot, but I spend most <laughs> of my waking hours like flitting from one thing to another. And sometimes it's minute by minute and it's handling lots of things at once. It's not really like multitasking. It's, it's just kind of like switching and switching and switching. And self-care to me is stopping and focusing um, 
and and having time without my phone. I'll say that. <laughs> like, like there's focus. And, you know, maybe for some people, self-care is just enjoying Instagram. And I'm like, no, it has to be phoneless for me. Um, watching a movie on the couch and like sitting through it, that's self-care for me. Reading a magazine and sipping coffee and, you know, and one morning, that's, that's self-care to me. I think when people think of self-care, sometimes they think of like bubble baths and relaxing music and candles. And I'd love for that to be my self-care, but I'd probably just fall asleep during that. Um, and <laughs> I want to be present for my self-care. Um, and I also, you know, for it to be self-care, I also need to be alone, to be honest. What about you, Ada? I think for me, it really does go back to that idea of putting your seatbelt on or your oxygen mask on before helping others. Um, I have personally burned myself out quite a few times trying to do all the things and be all the things for everyone else, including when I was leading some AAPI nonprofits. And it's part of the reason I took a break from that world because I did need time and space to really focus on me. And it's taken a few years for me to realize that in order to actually avoid that burnout, I do need to practice self-care and start taking better care of myself physically, mentally, and emotionally. So for me, I have different practices that help with that, um, that I kind of group under my own self-care practice, right? I think some of us, or most of us have something like that, or I hope that we all have something like that that we can turn to. It's not bubble baths either for me. <laughs> um, a common thread between all the activities I do for self-care regularly and even once in a while is that I can be quiet and listen to podcasts during them or listen to soothing voices during the rituals. So um, running, Pilates, dance, okay, maybe sometimes taking a bath and doing those things, walking my dog um, and sewing, all of those activities kind of fall under uh, self-care time for me. Well, and you work in the self-care and wellness industry, right, Ada? I do. Yeah, now I do. And, you know, it's an industry that I've followed for a long time before starting a business in it. Um, for listeners, I have a handcrafted all natural skincare line called Tron Skincare. And before I started that business, I knew that the self-care and wellness industry was overwhelmingly white, like think goop. <laughs> um, there was pretty much a, a, a huge lack of representation and lack of accessibility um, for people of color. And by lack of accessibility, I'm primarily talking about representation and also money. Like in general, a lot of what was billed as self-care is, is just super expensive and not really accessible to, you know, the average person. Mm. Again, look at Goop for crying out loud. <laughs> Being um, in this industry, though, or having products that could be considered part of somebody's self-care routine, I think you have to bring an extra layer of thoughtfulness into what you're offering and how you market them and how they're actually going to be used and benefit somebody, right? Like it's about knowing that your product is more powerful than just surface benefits of like cleaning your skin. It could be part of somebody's daily or weekly routine where they get to take 10 minutes to themselves that allows them to have time for self-reflection or even just a moment to breathe between, you know, work or family obligations. And part of the whole reason I got into this industry in the first place was to just show others that self-care isn't just for the Gwyneth Paltrow's of the world. Like it really no. is something yeah. I think that we can all practice and we should all have access to. Like there's a long way to go for folks in the Asian diaspora to go to when it comes to self-care. Um, and we've talked about stigmas around mental health and Asian cultures before, but I think there's also something to be said here about certain themes or traits in Asian cultures that maybe drive us away from self-care a lot of the time too. Yeah. I mean, many Asian cultures are also considered to be collectivist. So collectivist societies tend to emphasize the needs of the group and the goals of the group as a whole, as uh, over the needs and desires of each individual. And, you know, individualists is honoring the, the needs and goals and desires of the individual. And this, you know, it brings me to one of these hashtags that we often see on Instagram, um, hashtag selfish sewing. Now, Erica, I know you have some thoughts about this. Can you share? Yes. So I would say perhaps the word upsets me is too strong a word, but it definitely, it, it bothers me to see the hashtag selfish sewing because sewing is a major part of my scheduled self-care in my week. So I think there's a stigma and a shame to doing something that is considered selfish. And I don't consider sewing clothes for myself or that time I spend psychologically alone sewing. Rather than devoted to the needs of my children, I don't consider that to be a selfish act. And many mothers already grapple with feelings of guilt when they do things for themselves rather than on behalf of their kids. 
So I personally don't want to label my self-care as, as being selfish. For me, you know, people probably use, when they use that the hashtag, they use it in different ways, you know, and then the reader takes it as it is. And I can see how there's probably some guilt there, you know, because of that stigma, because of the coupling of, you know, selfish and and bad and selfish and not what we're supposed to want to be. Um, I think some folks also use it in defiance of the traditional understandings of the word selfish. So selfish sewing is a way to reclaim, you know, the word selfish. And it's, it's just down to semantics. You know, I think we all, we all come from different experiences, which influences, you know, how we feel about the word. And, you know, I'm not a mother, so I don't intend to become one and I don't bring the same experiences to the table as, as you do, Erica. And um, I, I like to think that I'm, I'm like the folks in the latter camp, you know, that my personal instinct, I still bristle at the word selfish, uh, probably because I did grow up in that collective mindset. And uh, so, you know, like Erica said, there's that stigma and shame associated with being selfish. Thinking of yourself first is wrong. Um, your comfort or discomfort is not a priority. Um, and there are a lot of nuances within that. And just remember, I'm talking about my own experiences, not generalizing. But I do imagine a lot of our Asian listeners, people of Asian descent, they might be able to relate. So I guess for me, I, I'd like to take back the word selfish. You know, I want to look at the word and, and say, oh, you think me prioritizing myself is a bad thing? Tell me, tell me how. I, I dare you. But before we came into recording, I put on my self-care sweatshirt. So it says, self-care <laughs> is not selfish. So this is like, I don't make any sense because I, you know, I'd love to reclaim the word selfish, <laughs> but I also felt like I wanted this billboard on me too. Like I wanted to share like, Hey, self-care shouldn't be seen as selfish, you know? So what I'm saying is, you know, I, I like to reclaim the word selfish and yet I still have that negative connotation with the word, yep. but it's, it's complex. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It sounds like it's really down to your relationship with the word selfish, right? Like, yeah. I think you both brought up a good point about selfish sewing in relation, quote unquote, selfish sewing in relation to sewists who sew for other people in their lives. And I am curious, like, how does self-care and sewing fit into the context of your life? And what does sewing or what has sewing given to you? For me, I think if I have to summarize how my sewing practice fits into my self-care, I'd say that for me personally, sewing offers me three big benefits, um, and those may or may not ring true for other people. So the first one for me is that it gives me a sense of accomplishment, that I, I did something. So I can start and finish a garment relatively quickly, unlike the project of parenting three children <laughs> or, or most of my work, which is really long-term research-based projects, mm. where in those two areas of my life, I feel like I have to artificially construct milestone markers and, and target goals and then be able to celebrate those small achievements along the way. But um, when it comes to sewing, I can conceive of a blouse one day, source the fabric and work out the pattern hacks and um, make it and, and wear it the next week. So <laughs> there's that undeniable primal sense of satisfaction you get after creating something with your own two hands, but um, which is very unlike parenting, where I rarely can identify my children's specific developmental needs, source a solution, and see <laughs> the end result of that in a week or in, in a short period of time. So it's really, that feels like years and years in the making. Um, but with sewing, I feel like I can, I can tackle a project um, and get quick results. And that's very satisfying to me. Oh, yeah. So um, satisfying. Yeah. <laughs> thinking about the second way that sewing um, is relates to my self care, I feel like it's, um, it's my avenue that I get to pursue creative passions. And I feel like it's a it's a, a very healthy place to escape to. So, um, you know, I know sewing is not for everybody, because but for people who love clothes and love fashion and love doing things with their hands, I think working out construction techniques, like, for example, how do you hack a, a sleeve pattern to create a puff sleeve or something like that? It's, it's a great way to let your mind wander into deep concentration and, and problem solving. Um, 
so by now we we're all aware that really sleep and restorative sleep is an important aspect of self-care. But um, I think there's also ways that we can think about how we can work active rest into our lives. So there's an author called Alex Pang, and he's written a book about the power of rest. And he writes about the downsides of over-identifying with one's professional work or your other identities, and then the values in pursuing other passions and finding your self-worth in other ways. So, um, you know, in his framework, I feel like sewing is my active rest. And then third, finally, I think sewing my own clothes is a practice that I, I consciously picked up again in my adult life because it aligns well with my just broader values. So when I was a teenager, I loved to do it for different reasons, but as an adult, I found that it's my way to embrace a slower pace of consuming fashion and clothing my family and being more mindful about my consumption. So, because I can only sew so fast. (laughs) So it feels good to be, to feel like I'm actively making a choice to consume less stuff. Does it feel like sewing time is ever indulgent for you? (laughs) Yeah, yes, (laughs) yes. Um, sewing is, it it feels like eating chocolate cake. Sewing time feels like that indulgent to me and, and it's delicious and I relish it and I look forward to the next slice of it. And because it feels so good to me, I'm very protective of my time that when I get to do it and when I have long stretches of time, when I get to do sewing, I, I feel like when I return back to the reality of, of, of my life, then, um, I feel like I've missed my kids And I also feel like a little bit guilty that I've ignored them for that time, but I also feel personally nourished. You know, if I'm lucky, then maybe I have a garment started or half finished, you know, to show for that time I've spent. So it's taken me a bunch of years to work out my routine, but for the most part, I have a sewing queue and a sewing schedule. So as we know, so is snow. Most of the time we spend sewing clothes doesn't actually happen at the sewing machine, So, you know, there's this, um, you have to conceive of the garment idea and then you pick out your pattern and your uh, fabrics and your notions and then you wash and you prep the fabric and you prep the pattern and there's hours of sometimes, you know, tracing and cutting and, and prep work that you have to do before you actually get to the sewing machine. So, so for me, I like to do the prep work um, in small snippets of time during the week mostly in the evenings when my kids are in bed. And then I I like to get all the, my least favorite parts of of sewing out of the way during the week so that on the weekends I can look forward to Friday nights to pulling off the dust covers off of my machine and then sewing during the weekend. And then on Sunday nights, I have a routine, a practice of I I clean up the mess that I made sewing and I put the dust covers back on and, and I fold away the ironing board and put that away. It works for me for now at this stage of my life, this nice um, routine. So does sewing, is sewing indulgent for me? Um, I wish it was, but honestly, no. And and I think I should say this, that probably on this call, I may be the worst advocate for self-care because I I love encouraging (laughs) people to do it. And I know the value of it. and, And I so badly want to establish this routine, but I struggle. I had to buy a sweatshirt to, to like get my mind right. And to try to encourage myself to prioritize my own self-care. So just putting that out there, just because I'm talking with you, I'm learning from the both of you um, about self-care more uh, than any, than what I can offer, but no, sewing, sewing hasn't been indulgent for me only because I think I have not managed my time the way that, you know, Erica, you protect your time, protect your energy for what you want and fitting it in still feels chaotic for me. Like I haven't done the work that you've done, Erica. It's like, I so badly want it to be indulgent. I want to savor every stitch. I just need to be better about planning so that I can compartmentalize my time and, and enjoy it. So, so I'm taking, I'll, t- I'll take all the tips. I'll take all the self tips, uh, self care tips from you. <laughs> How about you, Ada? I mean, I don't, I'm still working on it too. That is something that I should put out there. Like I, I'm constantly posting on work channels about how you should 
we do self-care and then sometimes I forget and I think we all get busy and, and priorities change and life happens. And so I think you have to also give yourself some grace there. I have personally thought about this a lot. When I started sewing, it gave me a lot of energy and confidence and empowerment that I could create the wardrobe of my dreams and do it on my own terms. I was just really, you know, excited to have that skill and ability. And I think part of it changed after my dad passed a few months ago. I remember getting the call that he had tested positive for COVID on Christmas Eve and then throwing myself into some sewing because I knew, you know, in my heart, I was hoping for the best, but um, preparing myself for the worst. And uh, a few weeks later, when I came back, I, I took a few weeks off from sewing, obviously, to go take care of his final affairs. And, and when I came back, I, you know, because the worst had happened, sewing was really helpful in my grief. And it gave, I gave myself a few weeks to kind of just exist in my house. Um, no one was going anywhere at that time still. And sewing was a helpful, productive activity I could kind of throw myself into. Um, and it gave me some sort of purpose. And the act of actually just using my hands, I think, to make something was really meditative for me. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, was not and is not a replacement for actual therapy, but there is something about the whole problem solving aspect um, that Erica, you brought up and creativity and, and even the predictive nature of being able to say, I have cut this pattern and I'm going to sew the seams together and I know what it will approximately look like <laughs> that provided some stability for me in that time. And sometimes, you know, it does feel indulgent. Like if I choose to sew instead of finishing something for work, but then I remind myself that I'm still sewing for me and, the, and my wardrobe and that I am in control of my schedule here. We're all adults. And like I said, sewing is one of the many activities that I do as part of my self-care. I think where it gets tricky <laughs> is when I sometimes stay up late on the weekends, mostly to finish, you know, just one last scene before bed and boom, before you know it, you've had podcasts on for four hours and it's 1 a.m. and you're yawning <laughs> and maybe you're making some more mistakes than you normally would. Um, I am privileged enough to also have worked in some sewing into my business. So I can sew those things during the day without feeling too guilty or indulgent, but most of my personal sewing for my wardrobe is still done at night or on the weekends, and those bad habits do kind of pop up a bit. I think, well, maybe not everyone, but I, I certainly can relate to the sewing unhealthy bad habits. Apart from something that Ada's, uh, not chastise me, but you do a little finger wagging on the not tracing. So apart from not tracing and not doing twalls, bad habits, yes, I know. Um, you know, for self-care, I get, I do get that hyper-focused. Um, working late into the night. Some, I think the latest I've, I've worked is like not work. I shouldn't, shouldn't even be calling it work. Um, like latest I've sewed was like 2.30 recently in the morning and, and I like my oh sleep. My gosh. So my seam ripper was getting a lot of work that night and I knew I should have stopped, but I just had this determination and that makes it frustrating and discouraging. And, you know, uh, I need to like take a step back at that point. That's probably one of my it's bad, but also unhealthy <laughs> sewing behavior. I know Erica, we, you were there when I was messaging one, like you were also up or something like one night too, right? When I was up late at night. For sure. I can relate into sewing into the wee hours, especially on a Friday or Saturday night. Cause I really love that the, the, the feeling of that I'm, I'm by myself. My kids are tucked away in bed. My home is quiet and I'm by myself. Um, and if I can stay awake, then it's really joyous time. But uh, usually <laughs> when I wake up the next morning, I sometimes I regret having given up that hour or two or three of sleep. And we know it's coming. We know we're going to regret <laughs> it the next morning. And yet we do it anyway. Unhealthy behaviors like this, it seems like it can lead to like even just certain negative feelings about sewing. Like we were talking about how it's it's very precious to us. But these unhealthy habits kind of, for me anyway, turn sewing against me, so to speak. Like for me at the start, you know, developing negative body image because of measurements and sizing versus ready to wear, that was hard for me to overcome um, as a person who is larger than your average Filipino woman as well. Like size, like they're just numbers, right? But it affected me a lot shopping and growing up. And at the very beginning, I was like, wait a minute, I'm a size 23. Two? Like, what does this mean? You know, and 
But on the other side of that, sewing also just helped me realize these are data points and that I don't have to attach feelings about it. I had a perhaps a Freudian slip earlier calling sewing work. I said <laughs> working until 2.30. For some people, sewing is their job, but for me, it's just not. So, you know, reframing that and looking at sewing as a joyful and, and good thing in my life. And yeah, when sewing just someone's not fun anymore, then, you know, why keep doing it? Is it harmful to just continue to do it? And I'd be lying if I said I didn't get to a point at some point where I was like, I can't do this. I can't. And, but I still go, you know, I still try to continue with what I'm doing. So. Yeah. We hear a lot of shows to sew for a while and then like put it down and come back to it. All, almost all of our guests so far, I think, have shared that, including you, Erica, in your introduction. And, you know, sometimes that has to do with practical things of like, you don't have the time or you don't have the space or or anything. But I think a lot of the time what we gloss over is that when something's not enjoyable anymore or it causes more stress for us, it can lead to burnout. And burnout is characterized by exhaustion, alienation, cynicism, distancing yourself from something, and even reduced performance. So if you put that in the context of sewing, um, we often call it losing your sojo, right? And most of the time when we talk about burnout, it has to do with work. And I know there's that stat from a Deloitte study, like 77% of workers in the U.S. have felt that they have, have felt burnt out at their current job. But it's important to recognize that burnout can also relate to sewing as well, right? Sewing burnout or sewing frustration can make you want to throw a project at the wall or flip your table full of pins, right? And at least it has for me. And I know that when you feel that you feel less inspired or you feel uninspired or like you don't want to see other people's makes or even their progress. And I'm not saying you have to feel creative or productive all the time if you are a sewist, but maybe if you're going through a longer spell of losing your sojo or not feeling like you want to create anything or, you know, be by your machine, maybe it's time to consider approaching you're sewing differently or consider, you know, what you're doing for self-care. Absolutely. And taking that step back is just really important. And often the hardest thing, at least for me to do is to separate myself and say, what am I doing here? I listened to this really great podcast from Seamwork Radio, and they talked about sewing affirmations. And as we were preparing for this episode, you know, we thought, what are some ways that we can address some of our unhealthy sewing behaviors and one of those things is, you know, sewing affirmations. So what is an affirmation? Affirmations are simply statements that are designed to create self-change in the individual using them. This is a definition from psychology today. It sounds formulaic. Um, they can serve as inspiration as well as simple reminders. They can also serve to focus attention on goals throughout the day, which in and of itself has the potential to promote positive and sustained self-change. So why do positive affirmations help or work? Um, studies have found that there are multiple different benefits from positive affirmations. They can help decrease health deteriorating stress. They've also uh, been demonstrated to lower both stress and rumination. And I, I struggle with rumination a lot. I'll get tied up in my own thoughts over and over again. Some steps to creating your own affirmations I'm going to use a recent sewing fail as an example. If you go to my grid, there's a picture of a hole. <laughs> it's a hole in a dress because what happened was I was so excited to finish my make. I was finishing a seam on my serger and I surged the skirt to the yep, seam. Happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Happens. There was audible noises that I made <laughs> when I discovered that. And I didn't just, like, I didn't discover it until I put it on and I realized that the skirt was like, tucked <laughs> up. I'm like, what is this? So, so here are some steps to, you know, we'll, we'll set that, we'll set the stage there. So a few steps to creating your own affirmations and, you know, relating it to sewing. So one, you know, it should be written in the first person, like I am, it should also be written in the present tense so that you are speaking to yourself right now. It should also be positively oriented. So no negative self-talk here. Don't give yourself the opportunity to include that in your affirmations. So for the sewing fail, and perhaps I should even say fail, I should say opportunity. Um, so a negative statement would be, I need to slow down so I don't screw up again, which is exactly what I thought 
when it first happened. But a positive affirmation would be, I have the creativity and skill to tackle any sewing challenge that comes my way. So the seam, again, this was talked about in the Seamwork Radio podcast. Uh, that's episode 23 called Finding Your Sewing Affirmation. There's a sh- link to it in the show notes. But I also loved how they address how positive affirmations do have the potential for entering into the realm of toxic positivity. Sarai, I believe, was the one that said this in the episode, but they said that you should still honor your negative feelings. They're normal. They're natural. You don't have to fight them. Affirmations aren't shutting down of negative feelings, but rather they are responses to your negative talk and negative thoughts rather. And for me, uh, it's weird. It's like weird and unnatural to talk to myself like this, but I trust the science that says it's helpful. And I'm working (laughs) on incorporating, you know, affirmations into my sewing practices because I will mess up again and I will need those affirmations to, you know, reframe how I'm feeling about it. I know Erica, you've, you've, uh, read about negative self-talk as well, right? In my, just in, in pursuing my career again, picking that up again, um, I've been struggling with the, the negative uh, self-talk in that area of my life. And so I've, I've recently come across the work of Dr. Kristen Neff, um, who has a book about self-compassion and overcoming negative self-talk and the, those voices in our heads that say, you know, we're not good enough. But for me, when it comes to sewing, I feel finally come to a place where now I can just laugh at those mistakes that I make. <laughs> but I, I definitely I know that it, when it comes to other areas of my life, that that is something, you know, I, I still struggle with and that I'm, I'm working on. But I think we have to just remember that we have to be kind to ourselves and yeah. uh, to give ourselves the same kind of compassion that we give to others and that we hope others will give to us. So, um, but I also think it's important that when we think about sewing as a practice, and I think, I hope for many people that I hope it's a, it's a lifelong practice, like yoga or pursuing many forms of exercise or cooking meals, that you think about how there's just this unlimited potential you have to learn and grow your skills in this practice. And so there can be times when you want to take on a challenge and push yourselves to new levels in your sewing practice. But it's it's okay, too, to just hang back, and there'll be times when you can just slowly maintain the skills that you already have. And, and for me, because I'm not a professional in sewing, there are no demands on me when I, when I do it. This is a choice that I make, and you know I can agree to write uh, a guest blog post on a deadline, or I can pattern test on a deadline, or I can make a Halloween costume for a child before October 31st, but these are all choices that I can Mm -hmm. opt into or out of depending on what else is going on in my life. So I feel like I try and actively um, find that, that balance, that happy, happy place um, so that sewing can hopefully remain in my life for the long haul for other people. It it may not, and that's okay. So for example, you know, I've, I've tried to pursue yoga on and off in my life and um, there are times that I've done it regularly and times when I've let it drop out and, and I feel like that's okay. That's okay too. It's a choice. (laughs) Fundamentally. And and fortunately for us, I feel like sewing is a choice that we make um, and a privilege that we have because we can make the time to do it. And so I, I just hope that it's a, it's a positive experience for the people who, who choose to sew their own wardrobes. And otherwise, we can choose not to do it. And we'll still be able to find clothes to wear. That's true. <laughs> true. It's true. We will not be naked. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yoga as a practice, as a part of self-care, it like deserves its own full-on episode or series. And I know especially if you are of South Asian descent, you you probably have some thoughts and feelings about uh, yoga in the Western world. I know even as somebody who does practice it regularly, I have many thoughts and feelings about that. So maybe we can come back to that in our cultural appropriation part two episode. But for now, let's talk about some practical strategies for mindfully approaching your sewing practice when you get to your machine. So for me, um, I do this like five question check-in now that I learned from just general like self-care <laughs> advice that I got elsewhere. And so this, the five questions that I ask when I sit down at my machine or when I'm working on something for my sewing or, you know, cutting, unpicking, 
et cetera, I ask myself or I try to ask myself, how am I feeling right now? Like physically, emotionally, or mentally, am I bringing anything to what I'm doing right now from elsewhere? And do these feelings feel similar um, to anything I have felt in the past or how have I handled them in the past and what has served me in the past as well versus like what won't serve me right now and what can I do right now to feel soothed or empowered Um, and we'll put those five questions in the show notes as well so that you can ask them to yourself as well right and If you've come to a place where you're mindfully sewing and this is part of your self-care, like you're taking this moment for yourself, you could also ask yourself some questions like, how can I make sewing more beneficial for me? Or why am I doing this? And what does it mean to me? Uh, What do I hope to gain from this as you sit down at your sewing machine? And then perhaps most importantly for me, when do I need to step away and is it no longer serving me? That's a good one. I love I love all of those questions. To wrap up the show, I would love to ask both of you, what is one commitment you're going to make for your own self-care? And I can start first and share. I think I'm going to try to sew slower and really start to take more time or take my time with makes so I can really enjoy more of the actual like process of creating. Yeah, I think that's a good one. Something I'm working on in general is feeling less guilt. So when I focus on one pull in my life, I often feel guilty that I'm not doing something else. So I'm working on having more self-compassion about my choices so I can be present in each activity I choose to do and each place I choose to be so I can reduce the feelings of, of guilt when I do so. I think for me, it's going to be continue to use Instagram as inspiration, but not falling into the trap of comparison. I like to think that I don't do that. And and what I take away is inspiration. But sometimes if I'm feeling for other reasons, for any reason, really down or something, you know, it's no longer a a healthy thing because I start to compare myself to other folks. So my self-care commitment is to be more kind to myself and not compare my progress and my skill to others. Now that we've shared those commitments with each other and our listeners, when this episode comes out, I would love to know how they go and maybe we can check in on them again in a few months to see how we're doing. Sure. Sounds good. (laughs) No pressure. (laughs) Thank you so much for joining us on this week's episode of the Asian Sewist Collective podcast. Next week, we will be having a conversation about quilting. If you like our show, you can support us by following us on Instagram at Asian Sewist Collective. That's one word, Asian Sewist Collective. You can also help us by spreading the word and telling your friends. We would also appreciate if you could rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts. Pocket Casts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. All of the links and resources mentioned in today's episode will be in the show notes on our website. That's asiansoistcollective.com. And we'd love to hear from you. Email us with your questions, comments, or even voice messages if you want to be featured on a future episode at asiansoistcollective at gmail.com. This episode was researched by Eileen Lung, Esther Lee, produced by Ada Chen, and edited by Brendel Zarate. Thank you so much to the other members of our collective who made this week's episode a reality. This is the Asian Sewist Collective Podcast, and we'll see you next week.